This whole unit is a physical sciences unit. It focuses on energy and of the many types of energy, it focuses specifically on kinetic energy or the energy that an object has due to its motion. And um, we're all kind of centering the learning around a phenomenon that's based in baseball or softball. So we're going to see a lot of um, really everything here we're learning within the context of um, these particular sports. So just a brief rundown of what we'll be talking about in this presentation today. Uh, we'll talk about the kind of general overview of the content and the main ideas that students are going to be interacting with throughout this unit. And then we're really going to do a deep dive into every single lesson, um, kind of picking apart uh, the three dimensional learning aspects that we talked about in our previous NGSS workshop, um, really just talking about uh, the most effective ways to get our students to learn science as scientists and specifically what that's going to look like in each of these lessons and even in separate phases of the lessons. Uh, we'll have a brief discussion about energy itself as a concept because um, energy is really kind of a rather abstract concept. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of misconceptions surrounding it. So um, as a physicist, I just wanted to get a couple ideas clarified and then I'll be available for questions and clarifications will specifically have a time uh, where I'll ask you for many questions and clarifications, but please, um, I want this to be as interactive as possible. So seriously, if there's any point throughout this presentation where you have a question or you want a clarification, uh, don't hesitate to reach out and stop me and say, hold on for a second. Um, I just want to be here to help you understand the best that you can, and I'd like to communicate everything as clearly as possible. So if there's anything that you're struggling with, just shout it out. Uh, and then once we're done breaking down this physical sciences unit specifically, we'll just go over everything uh, that you need to know to really implement the Escalar program. Um, so this includes like learning how to use and access learning resources for students and your teacher materials but then also more study type logistical topics. Um, basically what we need from you um, and how to report things like student data, how to make accounts for your students and link them to yours. And um, we'll go ahead and get started. So just for a little bit of context, um, we can kind of look back at the ideas that students have interacted with previously by this grade about energy. Uh, these are defined in the next generation science standards. Um, I know, for example, Tennessee doesn't adopt specifically these standards, but I know that the Tennessee state science standards are very similar. I've gone ahead and checked, and this is pretty, pretty basic stuff. So by the end of uh, grade two, so kind of K through two, uh, we don't even really talk about energy with students. Um, we don't bother um, really defining it, but uh, what we do talk about is how forces or pushes and pulls can cause changes to an object's motion or shape, which are ideas that we'll be building upon a lot throughout this unit. Uh, so really this unit is supposed to be the, for the first time that students are interacting with the concept of energy. So then by the end of grade five, uh, so in that three through five range, uh, students should know that moving objects have energy or kinetic energy, and that the faster an object moves, the more energy it has, just this relationship, which we'll talk about a lot. And that when objects collide, their motions change because of contact forces in between them. And actually, um, grade five doesn't specifically have, usually framed out for it, a, a unit specifically on energy. So all of these things here that we're seeing are uh, really like learning goals for this unit in particular. So we talked about in our NGSS workshop how Escalar uses phenomenon-based uh, learning, where a phenomenon is really just any observable and explainable event that happens in the universe or the world around us. And it doesn't always have to be something really, um, really wild or uh, profound. It can be something like some baseballs go faster than others. Uh, flamingos are pink or houses around the world are designed differently. 
But what we really want students to do is really just observe these phenomena around them. And then instead of just kind of like seeing it and letting it kind of move on out of their mind to really ask questions and become curious and learn how to investigate these things. Um, so the anchoring phenomena in this unit is just that some baseballs go faster than others. And we'll talk about exactly how we're going to introduce this phenomenon. Uh, but throughout the unit, as students create questions, create plans to investigate, and then investigate and answer these questions, here are the big ideas, really the kind of meat and potatoes of what we want students to know about energy, and then specifically within the context of baseball. So moving objects have energy, that relationship between the speed and energy of a moving object, and how energy transfers between objects that collide or just run into each other. And then, of course, down here is basically the short answer to the question that students will ultimately ask from observing this phenomenon. Why do some baseballs go faster than others? And um, students will have a pretty intuitive sense already and probably will try to answer this question and say, well, they go fast because um, I hit it hard. Or they go fast because I'm strong and I use the bat. But then when we really kind of ask further, more prompting questions and try to get them to explain the scientific why behind these ideas, they'll probably realize pretty quickly on their own that they don't really have the vocabulary or the scientific background to explain why. It's something that they just kind of know intuitively up to this point, because throughout our lives, whether or not we're physical sciences students, we're always interacting with all of these objects around us. Our brain is consciously or subconsciously storing information about how to get objects to do what we want them to do. So even though a student uh, at the beginning of this unit might say, well, some baseballs go faster than others because um, they get hit harder. Um, that doesn't mean that they already know everything throughout the unit and all of this scientific uh, background to explain really why does this happen. So to introduce this phenomenon, we're just going to introduce a couple of videos to the students. Uh, here's the first one. Have you considered going solar in Pennsylvania, oh but afraid of? So really that's it for this first video. Um, it's nothing super flashy or spectacular because that's not always the way that students are going to be interacting with the world around them. We want them to see ordinary kind of even everyday things and still see the value in investigating them and asking questions and kind of comparing situations, which is when this next video here comes into play when we really start to make these comparisons. So really brief, uh, brief clips that we're showing them. Um, we're not trying to open up with a video of Bill Nye explaining what energy is and trying to kind of jump off from there. We're really just introducing, like I said, these like everyday occurrences that we can still ask questions about. So we saw here with this batter, sorry, let me get back to full screen. Sorry. So we saw here with this batter that she is slamming on the ball. She's making these balls go so far away that we can't even see them on the screen anymore. And this is kind of that idea that we're used to with baseball. You hit it really hard, you try to get the home run. We call these home run hits. Down here with this second video, we're watching a technique called bunting, which is a legitimate technique in baseball, but we want students to kind of get curious about why would he hit it like that? Once he hits it like that, 
why is the motion of the baseball so different than what we saw up here? When you think about it, they're kind of doing the same thing. They're both using a ball to hit a bat. But up here, we notice that the baseballs are going flying super far, super fast. We're really focusing on speed and motion here. Um, down here, we see that the baseballs go really, really slow. So these are the kind of um, initial observations that we're gonna kind of encourage from our students. Uh, so just a brief kind of overview of this three-dimensional learning that we talked about in the NGSS workshop, but really it's not specific to these standards. It's just good practices for getting students to learn science. So we have our SEPs, which are science and engineering practices. We call this what the students are actually doing. What kind of uh, engagements and activities do scientists do when they're investigating something? So these right here, asking questions, developing and using models and so on, are specifically the science and engineering practices that are emphasized in this unit. Uh, over here, we see the cross-cutting concepts. And these are the more kind of general, we call this how students think. These are recurring themes and trends that kind of go across all of the scientific domains, uh, the ones specifically here are about patterns, cause and effect relationships, and the fact that energy can be transferred between objects. So these things are really not specific to a physical sciences unit about energy. Uh, we'll notice patterns or cause and effect relationships kind of in any domain of science that we choose to look at, whether we're looking at uh, how an ecosystem functions in Yellowstone National Park, or if we're looking at how the solar system works, we're still going to see patterns, cause and effect relationships and energy and transfer. Down here, the disciplinary, disciplinary core ideas. We say this is the, con the content. This is basically what you would find in a textbook, the scientific facts. Um, the, the faster a given object moves, the more energy it has. And when objects collide, contact forces act and transfer energy and their motions change. Uh, so one of the big shifts in science education has been the introduction of these science and engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts. So that instead of just saying, here you go, here's a textbook chapter on energy, read it, memorize the facts, and then tell us the facts, that we're really, um, we're really weaving all of these three dimensions together to make for a really well-rounded science unit and well-rounded scientists. So with all that in mind, um, here's another kind of big idea overview that takes into account these three dimensions of learning. So of course, students learn that things like baseballs have energy due to their motion, but uh, how do they get there? Well, we're going to be exploring a lot of data. We're going to be asking questions and then investigating those questions, sometimes through hands-on experiments. We're going to make claims. We're going to be organizing evidence and communicating information. We're going to create models. We're going to revise models. And then down here, this last bullet point refers to the engineering design team project that is really just the cherry on top of the unit at the very end where students have the chance to apply all of this evidence that they've gathered, their new knowledge to a design product that's going to help keep baseball players more safe, thinking about concepts like energy. So in lesson one, we're really focusing on introducing the anchoring phenomenon so that we can help students ask really productive questions, ask the questions that we kind of want to ask that are going to be useful. So the driving question here, why do some baseballs go faster than others, is devised from this anchoring phenomenon that some baseballs go faster than others. So the driving question is really the main question, the end goal that students are going to be working toward all throughout the unit. The end goal is to be able to answer this question using science and using all this evidence that they're going to collect through all of the lessons. We'll see that we're breaking this down. We're going to break down our progress in answering this question into separate questions. But this driving question is really kind of the end goal here. So how do we get to this question? Um, 
what's really kind of fun and interesting about this uh, phenomenon styled learning is that we want students to generate these questions on their own. We really want students to come up with these questions and we're gonna you know, have to give them some guidance to get there. So the fact is that we at Escalar have anticipated these questions. We have them written down. We have the unit materials already created, but we want students to really be the ones that are taking charge and producing these questions and choosing to investigate these questions. And that's going to require a little bit of guidance from the teacher. And we explain a lot about how we can do this, but we're going to see these focus questions and the driving question and it's really important to remember that we're not just giving these questions to students. So we're not going to come in on lesson one and say, all right, today we're going to investigate why do some baseballs go faster than others? What we want to do is introduce this phenomenon. We want students to ask a lot of questions, and then we want to guide them to toward asking these types of questions and then choosing these genuinely on their own to investigate. So something that we're gonna do to introduce this phenomenon, like we saw earlier, is watching those videos of batters hitting baseballs using very different techniques that have very different effects on the motions and specifically how fast the baseballs go. We're going to discuss patterns. We're gonna kind of get out their initial ideas. Uh, we're gonna think, what does the batter do differently to make the ball move so differently? And this is something we're going to return to a lot throughout this unit and kind of keep building and returning to these ideas. And then, of course, we're going to talk about this a lot in the next slide is how we get students to ask these questions. Asking questions is one of the really big uh, science and engineering practices here in lesson one. Lesson one is basically for introducing the phenomenon and then getting these questions out there. So, so quick mm -hmm. question. Yes. When you say lesson one, what is like a lesson? Like, is this a certain time frame that it's geared toward? Uh, yeah, sure. So this unit is made up of four lessons total. And I think each lesson has an estimated time of maybe like two to three ish hours. And I'll show you, we have some specific resources that break down. It's really like lesson plans for each individual lesson. And one of the main ways that we're going to organize a single lesson is by investigating a particular question. And then throughout the lesson, we're going to investigate, gather evidence, and then pretty much end the lesson once students have everything they need to answer the question. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, and we're gonna get into it, uh, a lot of specifics about what makes up each lesson besides these three dimensions. Um, so as the teacher throughout lesson one, we're really going to um, provide, it's, I almost think about like bowling, like teachers are going to be the bumpers along the lanes in bowlings where students are the bowling ball. So we're going to really want it to have momentum and students are going to have a lot of um, really different and wild ideas. And then your job is to kind of uh, keep them on track, guiding their ideas about energy and then asking a lot of prompting or clarifying questions. Uh, while they're asking questions themselves and getting their initial ideas out here. So the science and engineering practice of asking questions and defining problems is described using these two bullet points here. These are very general things that could happen in really any science unit. We want to identify good scientific questions, and then we should also identify which questions the students have that aren't scientific, like what would a baseball say if it could talk? Or maybe they watched that video and said, why is that girl's hair so long? And it's like, okay, yeah, that's a question. And that's something you can wonder about, but we wanna figure out good scientific testable questions that can be investigated really. Um, so what students are going to do is a lot of brainstorming here. And we really wanna get, we wanna get out as many questions as we possibly can from the students. And that's going to take a lot of encouragement. And if they, if you hear them ask one single question, we can say, yeah, that's awesome. So what does that make you wonder about maybe this related concept or this? And uh, this is going to involve kind of helping them out with their language. Um, you know, these students are fourth graders. 
So they might not have a ton of experience asking super scientific questions. So that's when we can come in with a little bit of this support and this guidance saying, I noticed this, something I wonder is this, or why is this different than this? Um, so starting with a ton, a ton of questions, and then you as the teacher will kind of draw attention toward the questions that are more similar or more aligned to our driving question and our focus questions that we're about to talk about. Uh, so in lesson one, they're gonna do a lot of brainstorming and then they're going to earn the word energy. And we'll talk more about what it means to earn one of these scientific words. But really this is going to be like a really big hint to these students because it's very unlikely that any of them will have ever thought before that something like a baseball could have energy. So you're going to drop a little bug in their ear while they're asking all these questions and maybe asking, why do some go faster than others? You can say, well, did you know that baseballs have energy? And they might say, what is how? How does a baseball have energy? What would that look like? And you might even say some baseballs have different amounts of energy. And that might help us um, ask even better questions. And students can ask, why do certain baseballs have more energy? Where does this energy come from? Um, lesson one, we're not really focusing on getting students to zero in on a super scientific meaning of energy. What we're really gonna do is leverage their prior understanding of energy, which is likely going to be what I call body energy, just how awake or how tired your body feels, which is very different from the energy that a baseball has. But there are similarities and differences, and we can use these similarities to get a baseline definition that energy is the ability of something to cause change or do work or make stuff happen. And that's the case for people or animals who can feel energy in our bodies or baseballs. And uh, throughout the unit, we're going to keep circling back to this definition and kind of getting a more robust understanding here. So we're going to ask a lot of questions. We're going to choose good, testable, investigatable questions, which is going to take a lot of work from the teacher to kind of encourage the right types of questions. And then if there's a, a certain question that you want your students to ask and they're just not coming up with on their own, then you can maybe ask that question to them. Say, hmm, where does a baseball's energy come from? And they might say, I don't know. And you can say, okay, well, that's a question that we don't know the answer to. Let's add this to our list of questions as well. So really we're just prompting thinking and we're taking all ideas as wild as they might be. And then just kind of honing in on questions that are more similar to the ones that we have gone ahead and designed the unit around. And here are those questions. Like we said, the driving question, this is the end goal. We want to answer scientifically, why do some baseballs go faster than others? And then these focus questions are basically like the stepping stones along the way. So the first question that we're going to investigate, because right off the bat, we can't answer this question with science. That's the whole thing. Students might ask, why do some baseballs go faster than others? And they're going to realize that they don't, they don't know how to answer this scientifically. So let's break it down into separate, maybe smaller questions that we think will help us answer this eventually. So these are our focus questions. So this one is going to be the focus question for lesson two. Why do some baseballs have more energy than others? This comes from that little hint that you dropped them. They'll say, why do some baseballs go faster? And you can say, well, some baseballs have more energy. And then if they don't know how to explain that, then boom, that's a question. And you can guide them to investigate this first. After they answer this question, that's the end of lesson two, they're going to choose a new question. And just like we've been talking about, we're kind of, we're kind of providing them the illusion of choosing their own questions. Um, because really, you know, we've designed these questions and we have them ready but we also want to give students you know, this impetus to really be curious and ask these questions themselves. So where does a baseball get its energy is another great question. And these two can be formulated. These really, these first two focus questions should be for formulated in lesson one when students are doing all that brainstorming. This last focus question here, which we'll talk about more later, isn't something that students are really expected to ask in lesson one. This is going to be asked after students have learned a little bit 
about the energy of a baseball. They're going to learn the word collision. They're going to know that energy transfers in a collision, like when the baseball hits the bat, but uh, they won't be able to explain that. So we can say, well, what other piece of the puzzle do we need to answer this driving question? And then we can say, well, if we really know how energy transfers in a collision, then we're golden. And this is the question that students are going to be investigating in lesson four, which we'll keep talking about uh, specific breakdowns of the lessons here. So uh, again, the goal of lesson one was to ask questions and get these questions for the unit started. So moving on to lesson two, we hey, talked. Yes. Sorry for interrupting. Before moving on, uh, can you also describe the uh, driving question board for them? And I wanted to mention that um, those are questions that we chose, we think are important, but if when you're doing the discussion with the students and they watch the videos and they come up with other questions that you really think are testable questions and are very important and are related to what you wanna teach, you can also use those questions. Don't, don't think that you have to focus on those. Those are proposed to you, but if there are other relevant questions that come up, like I said, you're always welcome to to use the other questions instead. And you can switch our lessons and see how the data may help you answering the questions that they come up, you come up with them uh, when they were doing that discussion. Because mm -hmm. there's a ton of relevant questions that could be asked here. So even if students are really excited to ask another question, that could be a good starting point for some like independent research as well. Um, but like Fatima note, uh, mentioned the driving question board, uh, the driving question board can be a physical display, it can be something that you organize digitally, but really this is just a central point where students can see all of the questions that they've come up with for the entire lesson. So this is going to be something that keeps them grounded with uh, clear objectives and goals in mind where in lesson one, they're going to ask all these questions. They can write them on sticky notes, post them up there. So it kind of gives students a buy-in to the unit. They, everyone has a question. Everyone sticks them up there. We can organize similar questions closer together on the board, but we just want the driving question board to be accessible to students throughout the entire unit, kind of as like a roadmap to where we're going. Um, and it can be really helpful too if there are interruptions in school, um, interruptions to your science time or anything. It's great to come back and say, well, remember last lesson we were investigating this question and then we posted our answer here. Well, remember we also asked this question over here. So like I said, it's kind of like a roadmap for organizing all of these student questions. And it's likely that not every single question is going to be answered. If you have 30 students in your class, you might end up with 30 in, like unique questions. Um, but again, this comes down to, like Fatima said, it's really like your intuition as the instructor, as the teacher, uh, which direction you wanna take this. But these questions coming from the students is really, really important because we want them to be the ones kind of taking charge and kind of um, setting the direction for their own learning, which really helps them stay motivated, having, having a clear goal and investigating something that they came up with on their own. So once we have all these questions, uh, we've designed the focus question for lesson two to be why do some baseballs have more energy than others? And what we want to avoid doing is falling into a circular reasoning trap where we say, some baseballs go faster than others because some have more energy than others. Well, some have more energy because they go faster. Um, so why do some baseballs have more energy than others? Again, remember students don't have a super solid definition of energy. Up to this point, it's still pretty nebulous. It's the ability to cause change. So what we can do is ask students, um, well, what can we notice a ball change? Um, so here's an experimental setup for something that the students are going to investigate to kind of really build this definition of energy. Um, it kind of seems natural to observe, get your hands on an actual ball 
and we can make it go different speeds. Remember, we're wondering why do some baseballs go faster than others and what could this have to do with energy? So uh, here are some images from a specific investigation from lesson two, where we have a ball going down a ramp and we can make the ball go different speeds from releasing it down the ramp at different points. If we release it down here, it's gonna have a pretty low speed. If we release it in the middle a little bit faster, release it up at the top, it's going to have the highest speed relatively. And what we can do is control the speed of this ball rolling down the ramp and then measure its ability to cause change to something else in a really simple fashion, which here is just literally seeing how many inches away it can knock a block. So this is really nothing fancy. We just wanna set up a ramp, release a ball down the ramp, and then here is an image taken from our website of a data table that students can use to organize their, de their data uh, when the ball was moving at a low speed. Notice that hmm, it only knocked the block two inches. When I released it at a medium speed halfway up the ramp, it knocked the ball six or seven inches. When we released it with the high speed at the top of the ramp, that block moved a whole foot. So we're changing the speed of this ball and then comparing the amount of change that it's causing to this block. And we're going to be having to uh, make a lot of connections back between what students are doing in this investigation and this kind of nebulous definition of energy, the ability to cause change. So where the students are going to notice that the faster the ball is going, the more change it can cause to this block. So this is how they're going to start building this idea, which is one of the main big ideas of this unit, that the faster an object is going, the more energy it has. So something, some things they're going to be doing in this investigation, some of our science and engineering practices, is they're going to write their own investigatable questions. We know what the investigation is going to be, but we want them to come up with their own testable questions. Again, helping them ask scientific questions that can be investigated. They're going to make their own data. They're going to do this experiment themselves, organize their own data in a table, and then use this, da this data as evidence to form an explanation between the speed of the ball and its energy, its ability to cause change. So as the teacher kind of supporting them throughout this, uh, we can help students in the usual ways with planning an investigation. Uh, what's our dependent variable? What's our independent variable? What are we observing? What's a good testable question that you have? Um, and then maybe helping them also form a hypothesis about that question. We're going to help them collect data, help them collect uh, reliable data. You know, if they're throwing the ball down the ramp, then they're not really uh, controlling the speed of it in a way that's reliable and repeatable to cause, to give us good data. So really just helping them form a dependable investigation with good data, and they're going to use that data to form an explanation. So constructing explanations is one of the other main science and engineering practices for lesson two. Uh, so here's the definition really, using evidence to construct an explanation. So some of this evidence is going to come from that investigation, some of this data. When the ball went faster, it caused more change to a block. Causing change is our definition of energy. So it seems like a faster moving ball has more energy. This is the big explanation that we're guiding them toward to be able to answer this focus question. But throughout the lesson, it's not just this single investigation. Um, students are going to earn the word speed. And when we say earning the word, we're not just giving them a word and a definition and that's it. What we do is we introduce the vocabulary as needed. So some students might already be talking about speed on their own, but some students might not have that language yet. So what we can do is say that well, we're talking a lot about how fast a ball goes. There's a scientific word that we can use to say that. Do you know what words scientists use to talk about how fast something goes? And that generally is how we're introducing vocabulary, having students earn it as they go, instead of you know just giving them a list of vocab words to memorize and use throughout the unit. So students are earning the word speed, which is very important for constructing a good explanation or a good definition of energy, this relationship between speed 
and energy. We're going to be talking a lot about speed as it relates to energy. Uh, we're also going to look at separate data sets comparing the speeds of baseballs that were bunted like we saw before in lesson one. We saw a guy bunting a ball, making it go really not that fast. And we saw someone slamming the ball, what we call home run hits. We're going to look at some actual data from that, analyze the data to be able to compare them. We're going to look at some cause and effect relationships between moving objects and things that they run into, which is a collision, which is another big piece of the puzzle throughout this entire unit, which we'll talk about more. And um, writing up experiment results, really doing a lot of writing here. Uh, here's an example of some of the writing supports that we offer in the website. If students are kind of struggling to take this data and make sense of it, then they're totally welcome to use these sentence starters. It's almost like fill in the blank, but with your ideas motivated from your data. And students don't have to use these, but they can be really helpful for students who have um, like special education needs or English language learners, students like that, that we really want to be accommodating to and inclusive of. So a main explanation we're constructing is really what speed, the speed of a ball has to do with its energy. Uh, what you as the teacher can do is make these, bridge these connections between students' initial ideas about energy, which is likely just something about how their body feels, how much I can run and play today. Am I really tired? Am I feeling really awake? Um, they need to know that that's not the scientific definition of energy, but there's still value to these ideas because we got out of that, this concept that energy is the ability to do stuff. And a ball is able to do stuff, even though it's not a living thing. So we're really making these connections and always kind of circling back to their prior ideas, you know, just like scaffolding this information. Something that's really fun in this lesson is we're going to be using angry birds to be talking about these physical interactions, which I think is really fun and unexpected for students to see something like an arcade game be a legitimate way to learn about the motions of interacting objects, which we'll talk about a little bit more in I think the next slide. And again, providing a lot of language supports. So a lot of students might have the ideas, but just might not have the words to, um, to really lay them out and explain what they're thinking. And that's when we can come in and say, well, you're noticing a pattern or you're noticing cause and effect. Bailey, hmm? moving to lesson three, um, I'm curious about um, uh, other teachers' experiences with teaching uh, these ideas of energy before, if they, we want to take a pass and have them describe if what you're saying is something that they have done before similarly or is very different of how they've been teaching um, these big ideas before. Yeah, sure. I would love some input from you all. Um, your prior experiences teaching energy, at least kinetic energy. Our unit is very similar to the ball rolling down the ramp, except we use a little Hot Wheels cars instead and measure it from four or five different distances on the ramp to look at how far they move. Nice. So you're uh, measuring like the distances of the Hot Wheel cars or something? That's Correct. Okay. I like that. Yeah, exactly. And, the same, yeah, the same, same types of ideas here. Mm -hmm. And what question are they trying to answer when they do that? that investigation or was there a phenomenon based learning involved on that? Um, I think it was looking at the energy each car had to look at the relative to the distance they then moved. Oh, nice. Like once they got to the bottom of the ramp, how far they could go. Yes. How far off, off the ramp they went and based on the height of the ramp to or trying to look at a correlation between the two. Okay. Awesome. I like that. These both of these experiments have like kind of a similar idea that we're not directly measuring energy. We're not putting a number on it, but like these relative observations are really important for helping students just notice these cause and effect patterns. Does anybody we, else? Hmm? We did the similar thing, but they had um, like the little box car, the the ones that they can carve and change and made their own. Nice. 
and they also designed their own ramp and then they had to measure the distance from the end of the ramp to where their car stopped and they so i mean it was kind of a mixture of things because there was different sizes and different shapes and different ramps um so then we tried the different types of cars on one ramp so, so that everybody could see on the same ramp so we've been something like that so yeah nice controlling variables between like ramp shape and things like that yes and then um we they we just did a bunch of different things and they got to write about it but it was some of them like we did the same two cars um at different levels on the ramp and things like that and then they had to make some observations but we didn't I think we taught about I'm pretty certain I'm just trying to remember I'm pretty certain that we talked about energy and that stuff first and then we did it so they already had some of the language I, this is kind of coming at it from the other side showing and trying it out and then giving the information the vocabulary and that stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of um, kind of showing again, like showing a phenomenon and then working to explain it from there. Mm. And if anybody else has um, any experiences they'd like to share with teaching similar concepts or similar lessons or even similar uh, practices to this, I love hearing that feedback. I love hearing what y'all are doing in the classroom. So please go ahead and um, shout it out at any time. It, we also did another one with um, dropping the ball from different levels. Like um, they used all the same ball and then they would, um, we put chalk on it and hit a black paper and then they would drop it from a certain height and we'd get up on top of a chair and drop it from another height and, the, and see how high it would bounce from the ground up onto the paper. It's, oh, cool. Yeah. So the chalk was like, oh, Marking the paper, like yeah. the data by the, the yes, chalkboard. yes, and then they could measure um, the distance, or uh, how tall, how how high the ball bounced, and they uh, next to it they would put, you know, was that from the ground or from the ladder or from the chair, that kind of thing. Awesome, and I love that it's it, it's kind of fun, like kind of whimsical things. It's almost like it's almost like play based or like play derived. These are, yeah, concepts that they can use when they're playing sports or like playing a video game even. Yeah, I love that. Making, making connections between what they're seeing in science class and then what they're actually doing like in their free time, bouncing balls or, you know, making soapbox cars. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move on to lesson three, but of course, um, yeah, go ahead and shout it out if y'all have any ideas, any inspiration, if you want to talk about anything some more. So um, where we left off was constructing explanations in lesson two, and ultimately the explanation we want them to construct is the answer to their focus question. Why do some baseballs have more energy than others? And then we notice that, well, the faster it's going, the more energy it has. But again, we don't wanna get stuck in this circular reasoning where we say some baseballs go faster because they have more energy and some have more energy because they go faster. So even though we've discovered this relationship between speed and energy, um, doesn't mean that we have all of the puzzle pieces to put together a really thorough explanation to answer the driving question yet. So at the end of this lesson, you'll you know congratulate the students on answering this question and then make a plan, choose another question that you want to investigate. Say, well, we're not totally ready to answer our driving question yet, but look at our question board. We have lots of really good questions that can help us get closer to the driving question. So then the students are going to have a discussion. You'll help guide them um, to choose another question to investigate. And then also kind of brainstorm ideas, planning on how they want to investigate. Do they want to do another hands-on experiment? Do they want to watch more baseball players doing their thing? Do they want to look at data? Do they want to read about it or watch another video? So really just kind of um, getting students to notice that like 
their questions and their curiosities are really valid and useful and can be used to drive their learning. So at the end of lesson two, students have answered this focus question, and then we'll say, all right, in our next, next time we meet for science, we're going to answer this next question, which we um, have designed this lesson around the question, where does a baseball get its energy from? Which is again, something they'll probably ask in lesson one, because they've probably never really thought that a baseball could get energy in the first place. It's not a living thing or an animal. So where does its energy come from? What does this energy really mean for the baseball? So that's our focus question. This is the question that we're trying to answer throughout lesson three. And again, we see this science and engineering practice of planning and carrying out investigations. That's a really big one in this unit. And I think it's really a big one for any physical sciences unit. Um, so what students are going to do here in this lesson is another really kind of simple, like I said, um, almost like play-based experiment where um, specifically in this one experiment, which is again, just a single engagement as part of this larger lesson. It's not just about doing this experiment, but what they can do is make observations of marbles that are interacting because we've made these observations of baseball. We know that a lot of baseball has to do with hitting it with a bat and then seeing how it moves afterward. So how can we kind of strip this back and get like a really, kind of basic approach to seeing how objects interact when they hit. We know that an object that's moving must have energy because it's you know going a little bit faster than zero miles per hour. But what does this mean when we involve other objects? Because we know in a game of baseball, we're not just looking at a single baseball. There's lots of other things that are interacting with it. So part of planning and carrying out this investigations in this lesson is, um, making qualitative observations of colliding marbles. And there's a lot of really detailed information that I'll go over with you about how we can set up and uh, set up an, a successful experiment here. Students are again gonna organize their own data and then use this data to form explanations to answer their question. And again, like we mentioned before, we're helping students uh, stay organized when they're investigating keeping a goal in mind, forming their own experimental questions, and then using their own data to answer their own questions. Uh, so some more data that we're going to be interacting with because um, I love physics, I love numbers and data, and uh, speed is really, really important to the fabric of this entire unit. So students are going to be exposed to a few different sets of data that help them learn the relationships and the patterns behind the things that a baseball interacts with in a baseball game. So where does a baseball get its energy from? Well, first thing, we know that it interacts with the bat. We watched these videos. We know that the bat has a lot to do with it, but what exactly does it have to do with the speed of a baseball? So something that we're going to do is look at this data. So here, this is given, this is just a screenshot from the student website of a data table it's given in miles per hour of the speed of a swinging bat in an experiment where a batter is hitting a baseball from a standstill. So the bat, the ball is on a tee and we're measuring the speed of the swinging bat and then the speed of the baseball after it's been hit by the bat. So there's a lot of different questions and a lot of things to investigate specifically about this data set. We're going to see lots of patterns, uh, which we'll talk about finding these patterns a little bit more later. Uh, but one of the big things that we're doing here is uh, making graphs, creating this scatter plot. And here's an image of just a sample graph. We've included a link to an excellent graph making uh, program online. Of course, students can do it on pencil and paper. But um, to practice, you know, as like good modern 21st century scientists, uh, these are really the types of tools that uh, we want students to start to become comfortable with entering their data, staying organized, and then learning what to do with that data. So it's one thing to just enter this data into a website and get this graph, but it's another thing to look at the graph and analyze and interpret what the graph can really tell us. So we're looking for relationships here and we'll talk more about finding patterns 
one of these cross-cutting concepts that we see all throughout science is finding patterns. And one of the patterns that we're going to find while analyzing and interpreting this data is noticing that these data points form a straight line and really unpacking what this means. To some students, it might look really unremarkable, but really this is a very special, like strong linear relationship, which students don't need to use the word linear, but they'll definitely notice that all of these data points here form a line. And what we want to do is get into, well, why is that? What is the data being represented on this axis? What is the data being represented on this axis? And what do they have to do with one another? We're going to find patterns. We can even make these patterns to make predictions about the speed of a batted baseball, given a certain speed that the bat is swung. So you can see how we're really making progress toward why do some baseballs go faster than others? And here's a huge big piece of the puzzle is that the speed of the swinging bat as the, speed of, as the speed of the bat increases, the ball is going to increase in speed too. So a faster swinging bat means a faster batted baseball. And we can return to our definition of energy. We know that a faster moving object has more energy. So we can say that a bat with more energy kind of results in a baseball with more energy. So here we're really getting all of this really valuable information from plotting uh, What's, what's really like a pretty simple data set, but it's about reading into the data and using the graphs and having discussions about why scientists use graphs. Why do we use this type of graph instead of a bar graph, for instance? What can we do with this data? And as the teacher um, analyzing data, you know, is probably going to take a lot of um, like careful observation, just making sure that students are keeping their data organized, that they're labeling their graphs appropriately. We're going to talk about these different types of graphs. If a student tries to make a pie graph, we need to talk about why that's not going to help us analyze this data in particular. Um, and then we're again, looking to make these connections and asking a lot of clarifying prompting questions, always circling back to that original definition of energy that we have what does energy have to do with the speed of a ball? Bailey, can I ask a question about how the students um, record their information? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, you're mentioning the website and I haven't seen it yet to see how much of it um, they do on there or is there ever any paper and pencil work or are they able to create graphs and things on the website? Sure, well, it's really flexible. Um, so we've designed everything uh, to be, uh, you know, able to be used online kind of in any setting, but then we also give you the options of, hey, if you want to use paper and pencil, absolutely. And then after, after I finish unpacking the unit specifically, um, I'll show you our materials that are available to you. For example, we have printable PDF versions of all of these interactive tables that are done online. So if you okay. want the students to just um, look at what they're, what they're being asked to do and then shut their computers and then use their printouts, like you're totally, totally welcome to do that. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so moving on another big science and engineering practice, more constructing of explanations from these many sets of data that students have interacted with throughout lesson three. So again, we're talking about where does a baseball get its energy from? Well, we've learned that a higher energy bat means a higher energy ball. We've seen that a moving marble hits a stationary marble and makes it start moving. And then this is the kind of evidence that students are gonna to use to piece together that, well, this marble had energy. And then suddenly this marble had more energy. Why was this marble gaining energy as this one lost energy? And we can construct these explanations using evidence from these investigations that energy can move from one thing to another. It can move from one marble to another. It can move from a batter to a base. It can move from a bat to a baseball. It can move from the batter to the bat. So lesson three, we're really, um, we're really introducing the concept of energy transfer, looking at a lot of data and then using this data as evidence to make an explanation about where does a baseball get its energy from? Well, it ultimately gets its energy from the players. 
you know, a baseball and a bat are just objects. If we just, there's no players, they're not going to do anything. But the players are use these to transfer energy among each other. And then this is when we get these really interesting interactions that make a game of baseball happen. Um, one big piece of this is that students are going to earn the word collision. So again, in the marble experiment, we're it's going to be like, well, you're talking a lot about making these marbles hit each other or making them run into each other. Scientists use a certain word to talk about this. Does anyone know what this word is? Students might be familiar with it, like saying that there's a head on collision or like a crash or something. So they're earning the word collision as it's needed to kind of explain these ideas about energy transfer. Because one of the big pieces of the puzzle is that the ball gets a lot of energy from the bat during a collision because it transfers. Energy transfers in a collision. And students will know this by the end of lesson three. But again, that's not all that they need to answer their question. So at the end of lesson three, we're gonna have a summary chart, uh, which is really just a graphical organizer that it's probably best for you, the teacher, to write while students are giving you ideas about what have we learned so far in answering our driving question? What have we learned that's useful for answering our driving question? What kind of evidence have we collected? What kind of evidence do we still need to collect? Do we have any new questions that we didn't have back in lesson one? And then this is their opportunity to think that, well, we know energy transfers in a collision, but we don't know how it happens. So as the teacher, you can kind of encourage them and be like, yes, that's a very, that sounds like a very important thing that we can investigate. Let's go ahead and, uh, you know, we can choose to investigate this question if you think it's going to help us answer our driving question. So in lesson four, we open with the focus question of how does energy transfer in a collision? Because we know that it happens, but we don't really yet know how. So we're gonna have a few engagements where students can collect evidence about how this happens in various ways. And uh, one of those ways is by observing collisions happening using really cool slow motion cameras. So here's a video where we can see a baseball going 140 miles per hour, hitting a bat. And you can notice that the baseball kind of changes shape. Now we can sit there and squeeze a baseball, but our hands are never gonna make it change shape like this. So we know that there's a big push happening on this baseball. And this is one of the ways that students can make connections to eventually learn that contact forces, which is another science word that they'll earn, contact forces are acting between the ball and the bat. And then this is ultimately a uh, key to their explanation of how does energy transfer in a collision? Well, there's forces. And remember, they know from K through two that forces on object can change its shape and change its motion. So again, just scaffolding this information here. And then um, while students are figuring out how energy transfers in a collision, then again, we can kind of look back and think of what have we learned so far? Do we still need anything to answer our driving question? And then students are gonna to start to realize, I think I know why some baseballs go faster than others. We learned about the relationship between speed and energy. We know where a baseball's energy comes from through these interactions involving collisions, especially. And then we've also just learned how energy transfers in a collision. So they have this really rich, specific scientific vocabulary to now back up their intuitive ideas of, well, a baseball goes faster because I hit it super duper hard. But instead of saying that, then they can say, well, some baseballs go faster than others because they have more energy that's been transferred to them from things like players and interactions with the ball and bat. And in a collision, the ball and bat apply forces on each other, which changes their motion and transfers energy. So in lesson four, uh, these are two different questions that students are gonna be working to answer. So it's their last focus question was the last piece of the puzzle that they really needed to realize. We can answer our driving question. So then part of the practice of constructing explanations in lesson four is constructing their big kind of final explanation to their driving question, using all of the evidence that they've gathered throughout the unit to explain why some baseballs go faster than others. 
And then one of the ways that they'll get to really creatively apply this knowledge is through developing and using models, which I hadn't mentioned earlier, but students are actually uh, given like a formative assessment opportunity in lesson one to create a model and kind of put their initial ideas out onto paper in drawings where you can see them about how they think, why they think some baseballs go faster than others. Students will have made these initial models about why a bunt makes the ball just kind of fall down and roll a couple feet and why a home run hit makes it fly hundreds and hundreds of feet. Uh, so we can talk about the scientific importance of using models in communicating information and describing motion. And then culminating this entire unit's experience they're going to get the chance to create scientific models in an engineering design cycle, which we're going to talk about um, in a couple more slides. They're going to use models to really kind of apply this new knowledge that they've gathered to a new situation, which is designing safety gear to keep players safe from a fast moving baseball. They'll learn that fast moving baseballs have a lot of energy. But there are, uh, they're going to collect evidence along the way that this energy can be dangerous and that there are steps we can take by engineering uh, something like a helmet or a face guard or like padding that like an umpire would wear. Using ideas about energy and energy transfer and collision and then using models to really get these ideas out there and communicated. Uh, so that's the all of the science and engineering practices, at least, you know, the the big uh, the big emphasized one in this unit. Of course, there's other practices that they're going to be using, but these are the ones that we're really kind of assessing and evaluating for for learning throughout the unit. Um, so you'll notice that this unit is really excellent for integrating uh, math ideas. I know that as an uh, elementary teacher, time is of the essence and science can kind of get squeezed out sometimes. So there's a lot of great opportunities to kind of use your math time to, um, to integrate that into your science time or vice versa. There's lots of opportunities for dealing with numbers. They're gonna practice converting units of speed and thinking about what does a unit of speed even mean? And how can we use math to make sense of something like meters per second? How can we take averages of data to compare them? And like we talked about graphing, creating plots, creating certain types of plots and looking for information from there. Um, so does anyone have any uh, kind of cool experiences or um, any other insight with integrating your math and science lessons together? Do you find that you're, um, kind of often able to enrich your science classes with uh, like math teaching points. I try to use science in my challenge question, math questions. So we're currently doing um, the ecosystem. And so I try, I put a challenge question, I tried to use something to do with the ecosystem um, in my challenge questions. And so um, like they're learning about seeds and that type of thing. And so I'll use seeds in our multiplication or factoring like, so there were 25 apples and there are 10 seeds in each apple. And then they had to, you know, figure out that type of thing or 25 seeds in each apple or you know anything like that I try to throw it in um, but we also did it with factoring um, and then they had to sort them into baskets um, that were only a certain size and it, it was we just I just try to throw it in whatever it is that we're learning about in their math challenge question. Yeah that sounds great especially that it's hands-on and they can get a physical kind of feel for what this math means behind just looking at numbers. And then when we were doing um, adding and subtracting with bigger numbers, um, we talked about the cells, how many cells were in the body. And so we tried to use the big numbers that we, not in the body, but like in an organism mm -hmm. and try to use those big numbers. And I'd have them try to guess um, how many cells there would be. And then we would 
um, I would show them how many there really were and they was really shocked at how many cells there are. So just little things like that. So when we're adding larger numbers and that kind of stuff, they can realize that, wow, there's a lot of cells, you know, things like that. Just right. Yeah, that sounds great. Just getting a more intuitive sense of what these numbers really can mean and signify, especially when it's something so profound as like a hundred trillion or something like the number of yeah. cells in organism. Yeah, because they because they're learning, they're just learning like millions and stuff right now. And I'm like, oh no, because they that's what they think. That's a big number to them. But yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Excellent. Um, today we were um, discussing changes in the environment and how they can impact the organisms that live there. And so we were analyzing some graphs that I had put up on the board and, um, you know, we're able to bring in some of the vocabulary from math, like range, you know, what's the lowest number we see, what's the highest number we see, you know, um, just kind of trying to find the difference between those two numbers and things like that. So. Nice. Yeah. Weather, things like weather and climate can make such an awesome data set that's very real to students too, to analyze. Yeah, sweet. Um, Bailey, we have uh, yeah. 11 minutes left, so you know. Okay, thank you. Um, so one other, other discipline that we can integrate in this lesson is uh, kind of reading like English language arts and literacy. We're doing a lot of writing, a lot of communicating of ideas, backing up uh, explanations with evidence, gathering this evidence from things, not just only scientific texts, like here we have the cover of a little magazine paper about collisions, but also things like data or qualitative observations. Uh, so we really find that this is like a pretty well-rounded unit that can fit in nicely, um, especially if you have the opportunity to plan ahead and think about how you can kind of save time between these different subjects. Uh, so one of the other three-dimensional uh, learning aspects besides the science and engineering practices and the disciplinary core ideas, which is like the, the science facts, is these cross-cutting concepts. And these are things that are present throughout all of science. And we're always basically gonna see these happening everywhere. But again, in our unit, uh, specifically this energy unit, there's a few that are stressed um, a little bit more than others. Uh, one of these is patterns, which we talked about this before. Like, this is just one example of this linear relationship. What does this pattern mean? What does this tell us about speed and energy and collisions? And how can we use it to make predictions? Uh, another cross-cutting concept is cause and effect, which we're going to see this absolutely everywhere. We're explaining change, such as changes in speed or changes in motion due to cause and effect relationships. And here's a little still from Angry Birds. Again, I'll talk about how we can use Angry Birds to uh, make these like very valid scientific conclusions about cause and effect while still, you know, having the opportunity to do something a little bit fun and whimsical, but um, still very relevant to these ideas that we're talking about speed and collisions and um, energy transfer. And then energy and matter is a cross-cutting concept because we find this literally throughout the entire universe. There's energy everywhere. Everything has energy. So this one's stressed a lot. This is in every, this is very present in every single lesson in this unit. It's really all about how, uh, you know, many ways that energy can be transferred between objects. And one example is say like a collision with a bat and a baseball or when two marbles bump together. How we as people can use our body energy to throw a ball and then suddenly the ball has some of that energy that used to be ours essentially. Uh, so really quick, I've attached, um, I'm gonna get into some teacher materials here. I've attached uh, useful links to like an energy learning resource. If you wanna just like brush up on the concept, basically here's our basic uh, definition of energy, the ability to do work or cause change. We're not gonna to try to quantify energy. We're not going to assign numbers or measure it directly. We're mostly going to be working through um, this relationship specifically with an object's speed. Um, if you've studied kinetic energy before, then um, I'm sure you know that it's weight also has something to do with it. Um, and because of this, we want to avoid making uh, really vague generaliz generalizations that any faster moving object must have more energy. So picture like if you had a ping pong ball and a bowling ball going the same speed, the bowling ball has more energy. So we're not gonna try to compare those. Really, we're mostly gonna be talking about changes in energy and relative amounts of energy. 
Does a bat have more energy when it's moving faster or slower? Does this marble have more or less energy before or after a collision? And uh, we went over a lot of these before, just the words we have earned, which uh, you're encouraged to display these on a public board somewhere for students to uh, display and hang up as they earn these words. And then you're also welcome to add other boards to the word at your discretion, however you'd like. When you discover other helpful words for students, go ahead and stick them up there. But the important thing is that the vocabulary is introduced as they come across these concepts and not before then. Um, so I know we're a little short for time, so I'm gonna skim uh, over just the engineering design solutions. Um, really, we're going to come to this realization that the energy of a baseball can hurt people. And because of this, uh, baseball players wear things like helmets and other safety gear, and that we can use ideas about energy and transfer and collisions to, to design these things. And then it's just a chance for students to get really creative, making a sort of model on paper. They can do it digitally, or they can use materials with their hands to kind of just apply this knowledge to a new context and really get creative with it. And we would love it as you come to this uh, part of the unit to share your designs with us, just shoot me an email. I would love to have pictures or videos and I can use that in other presentations like this one uh, in the future. All right, so now we're gonna talk about just a little bit more like SLR specific things, the uh, materials and supports that are available to you as you're teaching this unit. So we'll go over the teacher materials real quick first. And the main ones are the storyline um, and the teacher guides. And you're going to have access to a Google Drive folder that has all of these things right here. So the storyline, um, you're probably all familiar with how these work, um, but specifically, you know, we have our three, um, three dimensions for learning in each, besides just this is throughout the entire unit, but then in each engagement, exactly which of these three dimensions are really at play here? What are the students doing? What are they supposed to be figuring out throughout this? And we have time, obs um, time estimates here. We have what quest, excuse me, what questions students are focusing on. So if you want just a quick overview of what's going on in the next lesson, you can just scroll down, you can find navigation, how to connect from one engagement to the other. Um, so the storyline is kind of like your first maybe line in familiarizing yourself with exactly what is going on in this unit? What exactly are students doing at any given engagement? How long can I expect this to take? And which of these three dimensions are really, uh, really, really important here. And this goes all the way throughout the unit and even into our engineering design project. So that's the storyline. And then we also have these teacher guides, which is really just like a really in-depth lesson plan for each of, the, uh, each of the lessons. So here's the one for the first lesson. We have um, questions that we're focusing on. Again, these three dimensions, misconceptions or possible preconceptions that students might have any advanced preparation that you need to think about before we start teaching. Uh, we have lots of links. So we have links uh, to exactly what the students are interacting with. Uh, what type of sheets are the students going to need? Uh, how can I get to these YouTube videos? Uh, as you're teaching the lessons, I really, we really encourage you to have this open, read it through, kind of know where you're going next. And um, we give you example prompting questions, samples of student work. We're using the 5E model here so that you can kind of gauge uh, which part of the learning process your students are at. We have links to um, we have links to worksheets if you want to print them out. So like students can use our interactive sheet linked on our website or you're welcome to open up these sheets here and print them out if you want to do them on uh, with pencil and paper. So uh, these are your teacher guides. It really, it's a very detailed outline. Of course, you can take this unit however you want to. These are just like our recommendations, kind of our visions for what it's going to look like basically minute to minute while you're teaching this lesson. Down here Is there a material guide listed somewhere? Um, what type of materials? Are well, you, you, I mean, in one of the slides you showed like having cardboard and balls and that kind of stuff. So is there a list of what materials we need for each section? Yeah, you'll find that in the advanced preparation here. So like in lesson one, we don't have any experiments, but like if we go over here to lesson two, 
at the top of the each lesson, you're going to have the advanced preparation for the entire uh, lesson. And then it also breaks down by specific engagements as you uh, scroll throughout. So here we'll say each uh, student group will need a ball, a block, a ramp, and a ruler. They're also going to need this sheet and this sheet if you want to print this out. So um, I definitely recommend perusing these uh, teacher guides before um, or just at least during like while you're while you're teaching here. Um, let's see the student website. All right, let's get down to it. So escolar.tech. Um, you're always going to need to be logged in. If you go to escolar.tech, it should always take you to this login screen. If you don't have a, an account yet, go ahead and hit sign up for free now. Make your teacher account, and then we're going to ask you to report your uh, Escolar ID to us in a spreadsheet that I'll introduce in just a moment. So anyway, escolar.tech takes you right to the login. Hit login. And then the thing about these units is that they're not publicly available yet, because all of us right here, we're all participating in a pilot study. So Escalar has been up and running for middle school students for years and years, which is why we see this. But these units that we're interacting with, like the home run unit, isn't publicly available online. So to access that unit, uh, you'll open it through the teacher's guide. And it, each one is always going to have links to the unit at the very top. Follow these links, bookmark them. Once you open them, you're going to have all these drop down menus that you can use to access any of the lessons. But um, the important thing is to just keep these links um, readily accessible. Again, they're in the teacher guide. Book the, book, book, bookmark them on your students' computers. Um, because if you just go to escolar.tech, like where we were before, you're not going to be able to access them from here. Because again, this is a pilot study. Um, so this is the student website. This is what your students are going to actually be looking at and directly interacting with. Um, We've got a lot of uh, language supports here. Some specifically that I'd like to mention is um, a note-taking feature. At the end of every single sentence, students have the opportunity to add a note. Um, and then they can go ahead and save them if they have more ideas here. Um, then they can go and uh, they have the opportunity to see all of the notes that they've made at the bottom of the lesson down here. There's voice notes as well. Again, at the end of every single lesson, you can hit this button to record up to 15 seconds of audio. This is great for students who need help with, um, with like reading or um, like writing language supports. And again, these are all gonna be saved at the bottom of each of these lessons. And then you as the teacher are also able to go in through the back to access these things, um, to uh, access your students' notes and um, recordings that they may have made. Um, so students are going to be able to, there's gonna be these links to say like the notice and wonder sheet is going to help them observe this phenomenon. So if you click that, then we have this like interactive um, sheet that they can use again electronically. Or if you'd prefer to do the paper black and white printout version, you're more than welcome to do that. But just know that your students always have access to these um, these digital versions of the sheets. So like the asking questions sheet, this is going to take you to an interactive version. Or if you wanna find um, in the teacher's guide, say like for lesson one, if you wanna find the asking questions sheet, then um, it's linked here to a printable version that you can print out and hand out to your students. Um, so I see that we're a little bit over time. Fatima, do I have time to uh, show how to generate student reports or go to the uh, spreadsheet or? Well, uh, I, we don't wanna take more time that the teachers uh, have. Maybe you can follow up with an email on that. Maybe sure. you wanna close with the, uh, the survey. Um, they don't have to do it now, but just mention so they can get it done at mm -hmm. another time. Yeah, sure. Uh, so again, I dropped that link in the chat earlier to that post-workshop survey. Um, I also sent it out in my email earlier. We would really appreciate it if you could just fill this out. It'll only take a couple minutes. And um, this feedback is really encouraged, um, not only for us to make better workshops, but also for um, larger decisions about our program as a whole. So um, and you have... Uh, you need to have your teacher account set up in our website because if you open the link that 
daily posted there is not going to work. So if you don't, if you haven't created your uh, Scholar account yet, go ahead and create it first and then open the link. Otherwise it's not gonna work. And then the other thing about our assessment, unfortunately, um, we created them for students in mind, like when they get something correctly, they get a happy face. If they get something incorrectly, they get a sad face. So the survey is that's the same, but the questions that you are answering are um, open and not open and leak, leak are, how do you say? Um, less satisfac satisfaction questions. So if, whether you're not satisfied, so you're gonna get sad faces all throughout, but please ignore that is your answers, whatever you answer is correct. I yeah. think that's it, Bailey. Yeah, that's just a note for interacting with the uh, survey. Don't mind the sad faces, <laughs> um, but yeah, we would love your feedback. Thank you so much for all your time. Um, of course, I'm always here for questions or support. Shoot me an email anytime. I'm also going to send a follow-up email on exactly how to report your student data to us, how to help get their cr accounts created. We'll, we'll create the accounts for you. But first you need to cre uh, create your teacher account. Just go to slr.tech, enter your information. And then, um, yeah, we're available for support at any time. Uh, really, thanks again for being here. Um, I appreciate your time. I hope you found it useful and valuable. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.